Well, we're in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians tonight, here in the round pen, and Paul has established some things in chapter 11 that's undeniable, that's unavoidable, and uh, for many it's uncomprehendable, but it's really simple. And that's just the order of creation uh, and the order of God. You ever heard that phrase, the order of God? So in chapter 3 uh, of verse 11, we looked at that one verse last Wednesday night. Paul established headship and order. In verse 3 says, the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So that's headship, that's order in his creation, and then that's order in the Godhead. Uh, and this order, uh, God who is sovereign has determined. This is not anything that is orchestrated by man. God sovereignly determined that in creation. He didn't determine these positions uh, out of on order based out of any kind of preference or any kind of value or any kind of ability. A man has no more value in God's kingdom than a woman. Uh, God doesn't prefer men over women. Uh, men's abilities don't uh, exceed women's. It's nothing, none of that plays into it. It's just simply God's order that he sovereignly, out of his sovereign wisdom, chose to set forth, and it's for the sake of order and the glorification of his name. And when those things are in order, God receives glory because things work. Now, why did this even come up? Why would Paul even discuss this? Because this is a letter, and this is a letter, this part of his letter is a response, if you'll remember. If you go all the way back to chapter 7, and you look at verse 1, Paul says, now for the matters you wrote me about. So the Corinthian believers inquired of Paul, about certain things, and we've already looked at most of them. He's going to quit answering their questions here in chapter 11 that they wrote him about. He'll continue to discuss things, uh, but what they wrote him about, he winds down here in chapter 11. So obviously there was a discussion, or not a, dis not a discussion, there was disorder in this Corinthian church in their worship services. That's what the context teaches us. The Corinthian church, the women were acting out in rebellion to their God-given positions of order in the church. It's important that you understand that. They were out of their lane, you might say, as God had sovereignly declared and ordained that the women were to be in this church. Not just this church, the church, still in the 21st century. So tonight, Paul gets into really what's going on in this church. And uh, we read his answer to their question about what are God's standards for his church when it comes to positions. And we're going to look at a passage tonight that is so thoroughly <laughs> misinterpreted by so many that, that People love to just reach in and pluck one little verse out and make it say something. Matter of fact, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, right after we started Cowboy Church, and they found out that we wear our hats in here and that the preacher wears a hat, uh, a grandmother sent me this passage by someone who goes to church here and said, you tell that preacher to read this if he's going to wear that hat. And I did. And... She's thoroughly confused uh, about this passage, and so many people are, about what Paul is talking about. When you're studying the Bible, guys, remember, context, context, context. He doesn't just jump around in his subjects. Everything stays in context. Follow the context, and you'll keep things in order. So he's already set up the order of creation and the order of the Godhead. So his context is order and position. That's the context. 
So in verse 11, starting at chapter 4, Paul says, Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. It goes to verse 5. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovers dishonors her head. It is just as though she, her head were shaved. <laughs> now, holy moly, he starts talking about head coverings. What in the world does that got to do with anything? Why would he even, how can he jump from uh, the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, the head of, ev of Christ is God, and then he starts talking about head coverings. What in the world is going on here? Well, a lot of people really get off base when they get to verse 4 of chapter 11. Now, let's define some things. Number one, let's define what he's talking about, praying and prophesying. We know what prayer is. Prayer is just simply talking to God about needs, situations, people, etc. It's man to God. That's what prayer is. Communication from man to God, it's vertical. It's vertical. So what is prophesying? Well, most people, when they hear the word prophesy, they automatically think of the Old Testament prophets, which spoke for God, and they foretold what? what was going to happen. But here the word prophecies is a reference to talking to people. Every Wednesday when I get up here, I'm a prophet. Every Sunday when I get up here and preach, I'm a prophet. That's the reference. It's talking to people about God. It's man to man. It's horizontal. Praying is man to God. It's vertical. Prophesying or teaching or preaching, it's man to man and it's horizontal. So when we need to understand what he's talking about here. So when man talks to God or to other people about God with his head covered, Paul says it dishonors his head. And when a woman talks to God or to other people about God with her head uncovered, she dishonors her head. That's the issue here. That's what Paul is talking about. So the issue here is men with covered heads and women with uncovered head. And Paul says it's dishonoring when this happens. Now, why in the world would that be? The head covering here uh, or what's used to cover their head. Uh, is usually talking about a veil in, the, in this setting, in this, in this first century. That would be a reference to a veil. Everybody know what a veil is? Something that you drape over your head? That would be a veil. And that's, that's the uh, reference here. Now, there is an issue with men being covered and with women being uncovered when praying or preaching, or teaching, when doing ministry. Let's put it like that so we'll understand it. Now, for men, we're gonna, we're gonna, we need to say this because this passage is also used to distort women pastors and, and women being out of their position as God calls them. So we need to understand that for men, this could be in the church worship service, because Paul gives the instructions to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.12 that women were not to teach or have authority over a man. This was instructions for the church worship service. That's, that's not saying that women can't teach. It's just saying in the, when the church meets, God wants the men to lead. And he says that women can't teach or usurp authority over men in the church worship service. That's not saying that a woman can't teach other women uh, or children or outside of the church, but in the church worship service. That's what Paul told Timothy. Now, for women who are doing ministry with their head uncovered in the Corinthian church, it had to be either outside the worship service or to children or to women. We need to establish that. Nonetheless, they're still doing ministry, and men are still doing ministry. We just need to understand what the settings are. So what's the issue? Who gives a hoot about head coverings? Well, we don't nowadays, do we? It's not an issue in the 21st century, but it was a very serious issue in the first century Corinthian church. 
in the Corinthian society and uh, a man praying or preaching or teaching without a head covering, without a head covering, not with a head covering, without a head covering, a man who stood and taught or stood and prayed or taught, preached, whatever he was doing in the ministry with his head uncovered was a sign, a symbol of man's authority over women who were expected, the women were expected to have their heads covered. That was the Corinthian society's system. That was the purpose of head coverings. Women were to wear them as a symbol of submissiveness in their position to a man's position as God had ordained it. And the men were not to wear anything. So for a man to cover his head would be uh, a disgrace because it suggests, and this, I don't know if this was going on, if the men were actually wearing head coverings. I really don't think so. I think Paul's just using it as a counterweight or a counterbalance but for sure, the women were not wearing head coverings in this church. Not all of them, but some of them. When they should have been, according to this first century Corinthian church tradition. So for a man to cover up his head, Paul says it's a disgrace. Why? Because it suggests that there's a reversal of positions. The man would be doing what the woman should be doing, and the woman would be doing what the man should be doing. And that would suggest that there's been a flip, a reverse in the uh, order that, that God give. That's what that would suggest. By the way, this was not just normal in Corinth. This was, uh, it was, there was numerous uh, symbols that women would wear in those days signifying a woman's subordinate relationship to men usually and particularly with wives and husbands, but uh, head coverings was the most widely used and veils were the most widely used symbols of submissiveness in that day. Now, in the culture of the first century Corinthians, wearing a head covering while ministering or worshiping, this is a woman, a woman wearing a, a, a head covering or not wearing one while worshiping was her way of acting out in rebellion. That's not wearing one. A woman wearing a head covering while doing ministry, and I'm just going to say that, doing ministry in the church, if she had on her veil, that was a way, that was a symbolic way of her stating her devotion to her husband and demonstrating her commitment to God, her humility before God, her acceptance of God's sovereign choice and her position. And obviously, there were women who were trying to carry out these ministries in this Corinthian church with their heads uncovered. That was an act of rebellion on their part. So, how serious is this to Paul and to the Corinthian church? Well, it's very serious. Here's what we know. We know this through secular history. By the way, how many have ever heard the phrase, history has a way of repeating itself? There's truth in that. In the Greek-Roman world, we know through secular history, there was feminist movements back then, just like there has been in our history, right? We know that in the Roman history, there were many women's liberation movements and feminist feminism was a thing in the New Testament times. Uh, women would take off their veils and cut their hair to look like men. Just, uh, just their way of acting out in rebellion in the feminist movement. Women would attack marriage, the institution of marriage that God has ordained. They would attack that. Uh, that the raising of children was unjust and unfair. 
They would uh, walk out of marriages, leaving behind children's homes and husbands. All of this was in these feminist movements. Women would demand jobs traditionally held by men. And they would act out by wearing men's clothes. How many of y'all are thinking, yeah, that's what we're doing today. Just me? Am I the only one? I mean, seriously. Uh, so chances are better than not that these Christian women in the Corinthian church were heavily influenced by this feminist movement uh, or those feminist movements of those times. And they had an effect on these Christian women in the Corinthian church. And they were, listen, because this, this is what the rub is right here. They were removing their symbols of submission to their position of men. While doing so, they dishonored themselves and, more importantly, they dishonored God because he's the one who ordained their position. So, notice it says they dishonored their heads in verses Four and five. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head uncovered, or covered, I'm sorry, dishonors his head. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Now, is that a reference when it says head, dishonors their head? Is head a reference to their physical head? What's it a reference to? The head of them. You think so? Absolutely. Honestly, I think it could be both. Because when we dishonor the Lord with our body, our bodies are dishonored. Right? But I think the most of the weight goes to those above them. Those in a, a position above them. So, uh, if the men were covering their heads up, they dishonored who? Christ. And if the women were uncovering, they were dishonoring actually themselves, the men, and God. In the end, and what really matters is what? That God, in his sovereign choice, was being dishonored by these actions of these women in this Corinthian church. And that's why Paul is really making a big deal out of it. And remember, they asked him. They wrote the letter to him. So they dishonored their heads, those that were headship over them. Now, when this act of rebellion against their God-given positions is carried out, then they dishonor themselves, and then they dishonor the one set above them. And then, as we said, ultimately... God is dishonored through this. Look at verse 5 in the latter part of verse 6. Uh, I'm sorry. Look at the latter part of verse 5 and then verse 6. It is just as though her head were shaved. Now let's read the whole verse. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered now, remember, that covering is a symbol of her submission to the position given to her by God. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovers dishonors her head, which is the man, which ultimately goes to God. It is just as though her head were shaved. If she prays or teaches with her head uncovered, Paul says it's just as though her head was shaved. Or Paul says it's just as bad as if she had a shaved head. Now Paul is saying if a woman is going to reject the position God has given her by removing the symbol that shows her submissiveness, it's as bad as not having hair which was given to woman as a covering and for her glory. How many of you know that God has made men and women different in the way their hair grows? How many bald-headed guys you ever noticed? 
Don't get into that? Okay. When we see a bald-headed man, do we think anything about it? Isn't it normal to us? Not that everybody is, but I mean, a lot of guys lose their hair. Most of it, some of it, or all of it. But when we see a bald-headed woman, we instantly know she's doing that to make a statement or there's a medical condition, right? Because it's not normal for women. I mean, everybody's different. Some women have thin hair, but biologically, God has made us different, men and women. Women's hair outgrows men's, usually grows thicker. It's usually a whole lot prettier. I mean, we've all seen that guy that's got pretty hair. Just get that out of the way. We've all seen those guys who got the hair. By the way, in, in the 80s when I grew up, it wasn't a mullet. It was not a mullet. No, it wasn't. Mullets are from, mullets are from Lucifer. Okay? I did not have a mullet. But I did have long hair. It was in style. Uh, but I could never grow hair like a woman could. Now, some guys, they, they got that thing going on, man. They got a mop up there. They let her, let her gin. Just let her grow. Don't even bring man buns up, Debbie. That is, uh, Lucifer quit giving out mullets and started giving out man buns, Okay. <laughs> There's a difference, and there's a difference in purpose. There's a difference in creation. God created us the way he wanted us, right? If you look down at verse 14 and 15, you'll see that a woman's glory is in her hair. By the way, how many of you women ever get up in the morning, look in the mirror and go, let's go? You don't do that. No, you don't do that. You're particular about your hair wonder why because all the other ladies are no you're particular about your hair because god's designed you that way it's your covering it's listen to me literally it's your natural veil from god it is it's a gift and it it distinguishes men from women uh now, we live in a sinful, fallen world, and there's all kind of perverted things that people do to themselves to want to look like something they're not. But Paul says in verse 6, if a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have hair cut or shaved, and it was in the first century church, Corinthian church, she should cover her head. Paul is saying, if you're going to remove your cover and reject your position, then go all out and shave your head. Now, in Paul's day, there were two, there would be two kinds of women who might be bald headed. Didn't have anything to do with uh, medical conditions. Temple prostitutes shaved their heads. Remember, this is Corinth, uh, and it was a pagan city. And remember, the, the temple prostitutes would come down from the temple into uh, the town of Corinth at night, hundreds and hundreds of them. And they would seduce men, and uh, many of them had their heads shaved as a statement. Also, in Paul's day, extreme feminists would shave their heads to make a statement that they didn't want to look feminine. They wanted to look masculine. Uh, so when Paul says in verse 6 to these ladies in the 1 Corinthian church, I'm calling it 1 Corinthian church, the Corinthian church, when he says to them, if you're going to take off your veil, which is simply, and by the way, this really don't have anything to do with head coverings. Head coverings just happens to be the symbol. The problem is, trying to get out and under what God has placed us, where he's placed us. Paul says, if you're going to remove your veil and reject what God has said your position is, if you're going to skirt your submissiveness, if you're going to get in the wrong lane, ladies, might as well go all out. Just shave your head. 
and show the full rebellion that you're in, the full rejection that you're in. And that's what he's saying in verse 6. Why was it a disgrace? We've already said that. Because it's natural. It's a natural covering for women, uh, which showed their submissiveness. Does this make any sense to y'all? It's the way it is. It is what it is. So, uh, if it's a disgrace for a woman to have their hair cut or head shaved, and it was in the first century Corinthian culture, then the women should put her veil back on. Paul's given that example to make that point. Put your veils back on. Show your submissiveness. Now, we've talked about the biology of, of men and women and all of that, so uh, think about this, and let's kind of sum it up, and we'll finish early. This isn't about wearing something on your head. That's just a symbol. In the first or in the Corinthian church, all that was was society had deemed that as a symbol of submissiveness and subordination, their position given by God under headship of a man. And when they took it off, it was an act of rebellion, probably encouraged through the feminist movement, and it could be very dangerous for the church. Paul addresses it in a very serious way because it was a serious situation. Now, obviously, we live in the 21st century, and head coverings don't really mean anything. People wear hats and don't wear hats, and it don't matter why. Our society doesn't, uh, we just, it doesn't mean anything. A hat doesn't. Uh, we remove our hats when we pray. What is that? Why do we do that? Out of reverence for the Lord. Amen? That's why we do that. Uh, so it's not the head coverings. It's what the head coverings symbolize. And this doesn't have anything to do with hats and church or anything like that. It's got something to do with rebellion from the position that God ordained. And that's what was going on in this Corinthian church. Now, we're in chapter 11. In 11 chapters, there's only one thing that Paul has commended this church for. Everything else that they've talked about in 11 chapters, they've gotten wrong. What's the one thing he commended them for? Starting out in verse 1 of chapter 11, he says, I praise you for remembering me and everything and for holding to the teachings just as I passed them on to you. So he commends them because they wrote this letter. You're trying to hold to the teachings, even though you're getting everything wrong. I do commend you for trying to hold to the teachings. There's uh, 15 chapters in this letter, I believe. 16. And we'll see if they get anything else right. I would hope that if an apostle wrote a letter to three trees, he could write 11 chapters and commend us on more than one thing, right? I would hope, I would pray, I believe. But this passage that we looked at tonight, and I hope I didn't confuse the matter, but it's as simple as these women were uncovering their heads in rebellion to their God-given positions. And when they would do this, Paul says, you're dishonoring those that are your heads. Headship, you're trying to get out from under it. God ordained it. It's like the clay... Telling the potter, I'm not going to let you shape me anymore. Right, guys? I'm not going to let you shape me anymore. I'm running this show. That's rebellion. And rebellion isn't good. Look around. What's going on in the world? The chickens have come home to roost. It's finally caught up with us, guys. Years and years. We're closing these up putting them in the turtle shells of the cars, up on the high shelves, not teaching the children what God's word's about. Here we are. Amen or not? Amen. Any last words, comments, or complaints? Everybody thoroughly confused? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's good.